Welcome to this High Performance Academy Masterclass on the critically important topic of communication. It's a key skill that we require from all our managers and for those of you that attended the coaching uh, masterclass we did several weeks ago, we talked a lot about how critically important communication is and being able to coach your staff, being able to develop your staff and building a coaching culture at ABN. Daryl Cross probably needs little introduction to many of us. He's a highly acclaimed performance coach. He runs his own business. Daryl kicked off uh, the coaching uh, program for us last year and we had 17 graduates from the program. And we note that some of them are here today. So Daryl's already been to them and said in certain parts of today's session, he's gonna kick the session over to you because uh, you've heard a lot about communication already. So without any further ado, what I would ask you to do very quickly, if you haven't introduced uh, yourself to uh, others on the table, please do so to start the communication process. And please, in very briefly, tell them what are your key objectives for today's session. What got you here won't get you there. What on earth am I on about? Because most of you in the room have got a qualification of some sort. It would be a certificate. It would be a diploma. It would be an advanced diploma. It would be a degree. It might be two degrees. It might be an MBA. So what areas did you get those in? What are they in? Don't rush me here. Well, <laughs> I, I, a bit hard of hearing. I didn't catch all of that at once. Technology, I heard. Technology? Business. Drafting. Business. 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 Sorry? HR. HR. Accounting. Accounting. Construction. Construction. Marketing. Marketing. Communication. Communications. <laughs> Would you like to come up here and... <laughs> okay, I just thought I'd ask. All right, so about eight areas. Now, in those eight areas, what has happened is you've actually got some hard data under your belt. You went out and you got some hard skills. We call them technical skills, whatever. Yes, it might be HR, it might be construction, it might be accounting, it might be finance, it might be IT. Whatever it is, you got some hard skills. You went to some institution, you did some internships or apprenticeships, um, but you got stuff under your belt. True or false? True. And that has allowed you to move, get your foot in the door, get your job, and kind of start to move along the track. However, somewhere along the track, someone said, would you like to look after so-and-so and supervise them or take them under your wing or train them or, heaven forbid, manage them? And all of a sudden you went, well, where in my course did they teach me to do that stuff? Yeah, I got the IT right. I got the accounting right. I can add up, take and away. I can get the construction right. It doesn't fall down too often. But where did they teach me this other stuff called supervision, communication, management, and so on. Where do you learn that? Because we call that soft skills. Soft skills. And the irony is that the soft skills are actually the hardest to do. Let me say that again. The soft skills are actually the hardest to do. Now, I don't want to demean any of your certificates or diplomas or degrees. I don't. I mean, I spent 10 years at a university lecturing. I've got enough pieces of paper to kind of look, make the wall look interesting. So I don't decry any sort of academic training of any sort don't. But I can tell you quite clearly that the piece of paper you got won't get you to where you want to go 
and the soft skills are the hardest skills of all. They are really the tricky ones. And you might have gotten in the door with your hard skills, but it won't get you to where you want to get unless you master this thing over here called soft skills. And the question is, where on earth do you learn that stuff? Where on earth do you learn that stuff? Most people go, well, you know, got two eyes and two ears and, you know, we'll kind of fumble our way through. And some do manage to fumble their way through. And I congratulate them. But for most of us, we need a little bit more assistance, particularly when it comes to people. People are interesting, aren't they? You can tell them that there are 10 billion, billion, billion stars in the sky, and they'll believe you. You can tell them that the park bench has just been painted and it's wet, and they'll want to test it. You can tell them to drive on the left-hand side of the road at 60k, but somehow or other they decide they want to drive on the other side at 100k because it'll get there quicker or something. People are interesting. And the tragedy is, and this is the real tragedy, that they're not as nice as you and me. Always like we are. They're just not as nice as we are. And so you've got to deal with some turkeys. You know, we're just a room full of eagles, yet we've got all these turkeys out there we have to deal with. So how do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with what we call personality clashes? How do we do with it, deal with those people who just don't seem to get it, who are on another planet, who are rowing their own boat? Now part of this journey is interesting because this company has a phenomenal culture. A really phenomenal culture. It's one of the reasons I really feel it a privilege to work in this company. Because its culture recognises that there's more to life than the hard skills. Now I've been around long enough to know that there's not just one building company on the planet that puts houses together. Not here, not in Adelaide where I'm from, not in Melbourne where ABN Vic is. And if you go to some of those other competitors, you'll find there's a very different culture. And it's very much about, mate, this is the way we do it, bloody well get on with it and don't give me any lip. Just tell them what to do. But this culture here is very different, very different. And you can see by the way that that's outlined, there's a lot more going on in the scheme of things than your so-called technical skills or that for which you were initially trained. One of those areas happens to be communication down here. It's part of the high performance GM model. You're aware of that. And if we break that e down even further, there are aspects to that that indicate some of the dimensions of what communication is all about. We're going to tease that out much more thoroughly because it is much more than that and you would know it is much more than that. Before I go any further, I just want to say we are now going to take a commercial break. So that you understand quite clearly this is a commercial break and there's no pretenses at all. The commercial break is this, that if in fact you wanted to know more about this material, and people often come to me afterwards and they say, where can we learn more about communication? The fact is that there is a book called Listen Up Now. Some of you have already been exposed to it, some of you already know it. But much of what I know <coughs> about communication, and the learning and development people will jump, can jump on it, is in that, that book there. Now, some of the people in construction that I coach tell me quite cleanly, mate, I don't like to read. I hate reading. I get to the sports pages, that's about it, mate, but nothing else. 
So I'm delighted to tell you that there's an audio on this book. So you can get an audio as well as the PDF. It doesn't come in hard copy yet. I've been meaning to do that for about five years but haven't got to it. But it's a PDF plus an audio. And many of the people that I coach say to me that they listen to it in the car. And it, from a run from here to Bunbury, you'd knock it off real easy and, uh, and listen to it a couple of times over. But however, the PDF is uh, important because there are some exercises in the back of that book. Because you see, communication is not something that you talk about in theory. Communication is really a doing word. It's an action word. We talk about it loosely, very loosely, but it's actually a doing word. So we might have to do some stuff in a while because I'm not convinced for a moment that you sitting here for an hour and a half is going to do much more than simply raise your awareness. And for some of you, it'll raise your awareness to the front door. And beyond that, the phone will start ringing, there'll be messages coming in, you'll check your emails, and life will go on, and you'll forget that we're even in this room together. For some of you, you'll remember it a bit more beyond the front door. And for 20% of you, you'll get serious and go to the book. Now, I don't know which 20% is, and I don't mind because you are all on this individual journey yourselves. That's not my call. This is your journey about where you want to take yourself. Because what got you here won't get you there. Someone said some wise words once upon a time. The most important single ingredient to the formula of success is knowing how to get along with people. The most important single ingredient I guess I was fairly naive when I was growing up. When I was at school, I always thought it was IQ. You know, I used to envy Trevor in the class and Chris. They always had their hand up. Maths 1 and 2, physics and chem, they always had their hand up. You know, I hardly understood the question, let alone the answer. I used to sit there going, geez, wouldn't it be great to be a brain like those guys? You know, I've got to sweat and toil and these guys get it so easy. What it must be like to be a brain. That's got to be a, the single most important recipe for success. And I worked for the federal government for three years as a psychologist and then something came over me and I thought I'll go back and do a degree, another one. I went to the University of Queensland. I started with a master's. I did a PhD. I lectured for 10 years. And then what happened is I went back to Adelaide after 15 years, had another three years in Sydney at Macquarie University. Back to Adelaide. Got an invitation to attend an old scholar's dinner. 15 years down the track. Turned up the old scholar's dinner. Trevor had had a nervous breakdown and was driving a bus. Chris had dropped out of life, was living on a farm south of Adelaide. And I went, ding, what on earth is going on here? And the penny started to drop. The success in life is not above the neckline. It is indeed below the neckline. Your real success and who you are and your character is all about beneath the neckline. Yeah, it helps to have a bit of grey matter, but everyone in the room's got it. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have it. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have it. So that's a given. We know you've got grey matter. But how much have you got below the neckline? How much have you got those soft skills that you're actually operating on and using and moving on? Because someone else said, I'll pay more for the ability to deal with people than any other ability under the sun. Big words. <clears throat> and someone else finally said, the constraint isn't money, it's people. Now that probably might, might not mean much to you, 
unless you know the person. Rex Tillerson is in fact the CEO of ExxonMobil. Now ExxonMobil blotted their copybook back about, I don't know, 12, whatever, 15 years ago with a big oil spill in, in Alaska. And they didn't show any corporate responsibility. They were quite immoral with what happened there. But nevertheless, understand that ExxonMobil spends on research and development alone 20 billion a year. Here's a company just on research spends 20 billion and this guy has the audacity to say the constraint isn't money, it's people. You would have thought they had enough money to sink a ship. But he says, no, it's people. Now, there's a group in the US called the Stanford Research Institute. You may not have heard of that research institute, but John Maxwell makes reference to it. And he actually suggested that there were two main packets of abilities that lead to promotion, success, business success and profit. So if I said to you, look, there's a recipe for career success. The Stanford Research Institute has identified two packets of abilities. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? Wouldn't that be interesting to figure out, wow, for career success, I'd like to know what those two packets of skills are. That would be really handy. That could be invaluable to me and my development. So they went ahead and researched it and said, yes, you need technical skills and knowledge. Really important to know how to do the job. If you're an accountant, yeah, it pays to be able to take away and add up. If you're an engineer, yeah, it pays to be able to get your stresses right and your tolerance is right and uh, to make sure your measurements are correct. What else did they say? Well, they said you need some interpersonal and communication skills. You go, yeah, okay, get that. So, yes, we need to know how to add, add up and take away and do all the technical stuff that we do, whether it's marketing or HR or finance or whatever it happens to be and we need to be able to talk to some people about what we're doing. Is that all? And the answer is no, it's not all. They actually went a step further and they said we can give a percentage of success that's attributed to technical skills and knowledge and interpersonal communication skills. We can give a percentage. How much success is attributed to technical skills and knowledge how much success is attributed to interpersonal and communication skills? You have a pen, you have a paper. You write down two figures, please. How much is attributed to technical skills? How much is attributed to interpersonal communication skills? Folks, because it's a percentage, it's got to add up to 100. So write down your percentage. Who says that the larger percentage is over here on technical skills and knowledge? So, who says the largest skill is interpersonal communications area? Okay. So, what does that percentage sound like? Call them out. 90, 70. 10, 10 and 90. 10, 90. 30, 70. 30, 70. 12 and a half, 87 and a half. 20, 12 and a half, 87 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you be precise for me? Any others? 20, 80. 95.5. Okay, cool. All right. So Jeremy's correct. He's heard it before. Now, what does that tell you, folks? Thank you, Sam. People skills are pretty important. What else does it tell you? Better get good at it. Thanks, Jason. Better get good at it. When I give this to an MBA class, because I lecture in leadership at Torrens University in Adelaide, so I've got a class of MBA students, and I put this stat up, what do you think they say about the fact that interpersonal communication skills are so important over here? What, are they, what do you think they say about their academic pursuit in an MBA? Why have so much time and money to it? What's that, Ben? Yeah, why am I doing a 
dot, 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 MBA. Exactly. Because it is true, there are a few people in life who've got the gift of the gab, and I don't want to be disparaging, I seriously don't, but they're often in marketing, HR, public relations, um, sales. Uh, that's not meant to be disparaging, that's just the kind of personality that often ends up there. But they often have so much of that going for them, they can get away without anything over here. <laughs> or very little over there, should I say. Very little over there. <laughs> You know, you've got, you've got what is called the gas personalities, you know, that are really so much bluff that they actually get away with it. And you can see why. Because people place so much emphasis on this over here because it is actually critical. Really, really critical. And as Jason said, you better get good at it <clears throat> because what got you here won't get you there. Because everything we do is communication. Everything we do, is communication. From the moment you walked into this room, you communicated. I tried to get around to say hello to most of you. The way you move, the way you look at me, the way you shake my hand, the way you greet, what you say, you're communicating. You're communicating a very powerful message about who you are. You're communicating your brand. Whether you like it or not, you're communicating. Everything you do is communication. The way you walk through the office. I coach one guy on ABN, more than one, but anyway, um, one particular guy. And I've said to him, it's really important how you are in the office. Would you do me a favor? He said, what's that? <clears throat> I said, when you come out of your office, would you walk slowly to the toilet, please. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, when you come out of your office, you're burning the carpet just in the way you move. And what do you think that signals to everyone else around the place? What do you think it signals? Crisis, Crisis busy. Get out, of the way. Get out of the way. Perfect. So the non-verbals are really important. So how much of your communication is non-verbal? What do we know? What's the percentage? 93. 93. <clears throat> so how much is verbal, non-verbal? 7 versus 93. So you don't have to say anything to communicate. You can be sitting right where you are right now communicating. Communicating powerfully. Because 93% of you is communicating. And many people tell me, mate, we know what kind of day we're going to get as soon as the boss drives in the car park. You know, we hang out the window and we can see what kind of day we're going to get. And if we're not sure about the car park, we just wait to see he comes in the office. As soon as he opens the door, we know what we're in for. But it, he or she hasn't said anything. So it's the non-verbals that are communicating. So what's your body saying? How do you hold yourself? How do you conduct yourself? And by the way, that 93 gets broken down into a couple of aspects. What are those aspects, coaches? Sorry? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Versus? Thank you. And guys, remember what the percentage was? Where are you, Ben? <laughs> okay. Glad you're still there, mate. I was a bit worried for a moment. <clears throat> 55, you're just testing me, weren't you? 55, 38. So, with that 55, what do you think is the major component that people look at? Yeah, thank you. When they say the eyes have it, they mean it. The eyes are the window to the soul. So what are your eyes like? Do, do they look at people? 
do you look at them when you speak to them? When they come into your office, are you so busy on your keyboard? Like I had a professor at Flinders Uni. I used to come into his office to go, yes. Uh-huh. What message did he give me? I'm not interested in you. Get on, hurry up and get out. It was a pretty clear message. I didn't have to guess on that one. So what do you do with your eyes? <clears throat> there are guys in the coaching course who have been brave enough to say, you know what? One of the major problems with me is home and I, I'm, not, I'm not listening when my wife talks to me because I'm looking at the television and she says, you're not listening to me. And he says, yes, I am. And she says, well, tell me what I just said. And he says, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm done. You see, you've got to turn the television off, guys. We are single track, all right? We are not multitask like the uh, beautiful women around us. They have a large corpus callosum. It joins the left and right hemisphere. They have a lot of traffic going backwards and forwards. They can do 10 things at once. They can change the baby's nappy at the same time they're cooking the meal, at the same time they're putting out the rubbish and painting, painting the kitchen. It's all done at once for them. We are single track. And that means when we're single track, we have to stop, look, and then listen. It's really important. The eyes have it. So when someone is talking to you, you need to actually physically look at them. What else is it? It's communication is more about how you say it than what you say. The message, the way the message is delivered always affects the way the message is received. So if you're thinking about how you want to put the message out there, then you better think about it first up. You better think about how you want to deliver it first up. What's your tone of voice? Are you going to say it in soft tones? Are you going to say it in loud tones? Are you going to be abrupt? How are you going to deliver that message is absolutely critical. The real communication is the message received, not the message intended. Yeah, look, I'm as human as you, you are and there are times when I've had to say to my wife, but that's not what I meant. I'm sorry, that's not what I intended. That wasn't what I had in mind. And what I have to continually remind myself is it's the way she picks it up. Regardless of my intentions, and I've got to be acutely aware of that. Same with your kids. I mean, mine are all gone and left home. Um, <clears throat> they're all one's London, one's Brisbane, one's on a ship in the middle of the Timor Sea. They're all everywhere. But with children too, you've got to be aware of the message you're sending because it's the message received, not the message intended. The way we begin our message often determines the outcome of the communication. Remember I. What do I mean by remember I? Where do you think I'm going with that one? How do we often start off our message? Thank you. Who said that? Okay. There's a chorus over there. We always start off our message, or oftenly, often we start it off with you. Immediately you start with you, how do you think the other person is going to start to feel? Defensive. Defensive. Of course. Why? Because immediately they're under the spotlight. So if you're smart, you will start the sentence with I. So my wife's pretty clever. She won't say, you haven't put out the garbage tonight yet. Instead, she's clear enough to go, I'm wondering when the garbage might be going out tonight. Look, it's only a fine twist on the communication, but it just means that I don't get as prickly as quickly. Oh, yeah, sorry, darling, yeah, 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 yeah sorry, I'm just preoccupied. It, it's a little word, but if you start your, your sentence with I, you're much more likely to get it received at the other end more graciously than you, or what are you doing? 
rather than I'm concerned about what I see happening here. Very different emphasis. Very different way that it will be received and picked up. Communication is a two-way street. We have to give as well as get. It's both ways. <clears throat> and I don't want to be too sexist on this, but I think us guys have got a long way to go because typically what we've been learnt to do is guys go to, the, go to the pub, they have a few beers, they watch the TV, and the sport typically that's playing up on the screen and we grunt at each other. And that's a bit awkward. So when we get home, uh, grunting at your wife or your partner isn't really going to get you too far. It's a two-way street. <clears throat> and one of the things that guys... See, women don't have too much of a problem talking, generally. They can go to a morning tea at 10 a.m. and walk out of the cafe at 3 p.m. and it was morning tea. And she gets home and she says to the guy, husband, uh, he says, what do you, do you do today? I caught up with the girls and went to morning tea at 10. He said, you mean you were there from 10 until 3? What? What are, you, what are you talking about? We were just talking. Whereas the guy goes at 10, has the coffee, has the beer, he's done at 10.30, fixed, issue solved, problem done, ticked off the list, fixed, solution, gone. We're different, different in terms of our genetic wiring. And one of the things that would be really, really helpful for guys is if they really learnt this two-way street and really learnt how to communicate effectively. <clears throat> Not only for your partner, but for your kids. Your kids demand that from you as parents, whether you're a male or female. Demand it. One of the best places, by the way, to talk to your kids is in the car. They can't get out. They can't escape. Communication is a dance. It takes two to tango. It always takes two to tango. But it's hard work doing the tango. Really hard work doing a tango. Because people are people. And they make our life difficult. And so Lucy says to Charlie Brown, the manager, you say you want me to bunt. Playing the notorious game, baseball and... And Charlie says, yeah, look, just hold the bat out in front of you and try to tap the ball lightly. It's a very clear instruction. He's a good manager, Charlie. He's got a good heart, this man. So she, with the instructions in mind, goes out to bat. And he says, I'm a good manager. It's only the middle of May and already my stomach hurts. And as managers, we say to ourselves, I'm a good manager and I try my best but I'm just about at my end here. How do I manage these people? I say things that are really quite straightforward about how to bunt. You bunt this way, you don't go eh, like that. And yet the instruction is taken all wrong. How can I on earth get my people to understand me? What's the matter with them? Because people do not care what you know until they know that you care. No one could care less how many degrees I've got or what qualifications I've got or where I've been. They couldn't care less. But they care that I might care about them as individuals. I could count on five fingers the number of people who have ever said to me, what would you do your PhD in? Because they don't care. And rightly so. Why should they? But they care how I connect to them. Because that's what's important. And when you leave work and you resign and you retire and you move on or whatever happens, they won't go, you know, that guy was absolutely brilliant the way he could add up numbers and take away. He was just wonderful the way he understood stresses and tolerances in various building forms. And I've never seen a guy plumb as well as he did. When they leave, what do they say about you? They say, she was a great person. Or she was a bitch. Or he was just a great bloke. He was a real bastard. They talk about the person. 
and it's how you cared for them and how you came across as an individual that really counts at the end of the day. But what is it that gets in the road for us as people? What do you think stops you from being an effective communicator? And some of these slides aren't on your sheet. And that's by design and by purpose, because I want you to also do some thinking. I don't want to give you all the answers here. I don't want to spoon feed you. I want you committed in interacting. So what stops you from being an effective communicator? What gets in the road? 60 seconds, straight round your table. Where you go. What gets in the road? What stops you? So I wonder what you came up with. What stops you from being an effective communicator? There are a number of things. But ultimately, there is one prime factor. And you probably all came up with some reasonable factors and some reasonable aspects and some reasonable answers. But there's one prime one. And it's called the needing to win, needing to be right, needing to be superior, needing to have more or get more, needing to look good, needing to achieve, needing to possess, needing to have a reputation. Now what's all that sound like? That sounds like it's all about me, me, or I, 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 or mine, mine, mine. It's about self-granditure. It's about self-importance. We have a name for that. What do you think the name might be? Ego. Say it again, Daniel. Ego. Did you hear it at the back there? Yeah. Ego. Nice work. That's what gets in the road. Because if you're really listening, it's not about you. It's about them. If you're really caring, it's not about you. It's about the person in front of you or around you, or next to you. It's about someone else. It's not about you. I know there are times we think we're the centre of the universe, and I get that. But if you're really the person of character you want to be, it's about other people. Life folk full of paradoxes. Back to front rules. I can't help that. That's just the way life is. And one of them is, the more you give, the more you... Sorry, I didn't hear it quite. The more you give, the more you? Yes. Work with me, guys. The more you give, the more you? Yes. Exactly. Understand that paradox. And that's what it is in the workplace. You get back a lot more if you give to those around you and you actually listen. So why don't we hear others? What stops us from hearing? Not just being an effective communicator. I'm talking about hearing. What stops us from hearing? What would you say? What would you guess? What stops us? Our own chatter. Great. You are Noni? Okay. Our own chatter. What's going on with our own chatter? What does it do? Distracts us. Great. So what else gets in the road? Self-judgment. Self-judgment, yep. Richard. Richard, thanks Richard. Self-judgment, evaluating ourselves. What else gets in the road? Already having an answer. Yeah, I heard two there. Sorry, Carol. Our own biases and prejudice. Yes, filters and biases. Jason? Josh. Oh, sorry, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Josh. Uh, already having an answer and needing to get that out. Yep, already having an answer and having all the wisdom that we need to divulge to the world. What else? Thinking you're too busy. Make yourself. Yep, thinking you're too busy. Already geared up, up. Too busy for this, need to just get on with it, get an answer, get it out. Yep, all of those are right. So what we have, why don't we hear others? Well, there's some filters. Reassuring, we we'll often jump in. Ah, oh, it's okay, it's no big deal. It'll be okay. We reassure quickly. We don't really hear the essence of what's going on, the real core of what's going on. We just reassure. <clears throat> we give advice. Isn't that a biggie? You see, one of the problems we've all got, and we're all tarred with it, is we've all been trained in this room to fix stuff. Doesn't matter whether it's a roof, 
or a plumbing system. It doesn't matter whether it's plastering. It doesn't matter whether it's painting. It doesn't matter whether it's guttering. It doesn't matter whether it's brickwork. It doesn't matter whether it's the electrics. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's the accounts. It doesn't matter whether it's the marketing brand. It just doesn't matter. We've all been trained to fix stuff. We're all been trained in this room to find solutions, get the solution quickly, and get it done. True or false? True. We're all fixers. That's why we were hired, to fix stuff. And so giving advice is something we do very naturally. But it's where we are doing our undoing. We shoot ourselves in the foot, particularly if we give advice prematurely or too quickly. Yeah, sometimes we have to give advice. You know, if the place is burning down and people want an exit, you're not going to sit stand there and say, oh, let me, let me see if I understand you clearly. You want an exit? I mean, you're going to show them the exit and you're going to be bolting out there quick too. Sometimes you just need to move and quickly and do things and quickly. But in the main, it's not about giving advice. And besides that, you've got to earn the right, I think, to give advice. And besides that, who says you've got a monopoly on the truth anyway? And yet somehow or other, we all think we've been blessed and that our way is the right way and that our way is the correct way. What are they doing? What are they thinking? Who are they anyway that they don't want to do it my way? So we're all about wanting our advice. And that particularly goes for families, you know, kids and spouses. How come they don't do it our way? It's about talking to ourselves. And as no indicated, that self-chatter comes in big time. It's about intellectualizing or spiritualizing it, taking it to another plane, another plateau. And that means you disconnect from those around you. Because believe it or not, people, we are not intellects in this room. We might feign it. We might pretend we are. But we're not intellects. We live below the neckline. And then we try and rationalize it every now and again above the neckline. But we live our life below the neckline. Interrupting is a big one. Going off on a, on a tangent. But the one that you kind of alluded to it, a couple of you in your answers, the one that really, really pushes the buttons and really stops you from listening is this one. It's rehearsing in your head what you're going to say and you can grab a conversational opening. You know what I'm talking about? So someone else is talking, but you haven't heard them because you've already prepared the answer in your own head. You're already going to give them the wisdom from on high that is uniquely yours. You're already going to give them the truth of the matter because it is, of course, your truth and it's the truth the world needs to hear. And you're rehearsing your head to a point where you don't hear the essence of what they've got to say. So there are actually a number of levels of listening. <clears throat> there is, in fact, the ignoring. Yeah, you can do that. The pretending one. This is recognised by responses like, yeah, uh-huh, right. You hear that in a lot of marriages. Happens in a lot of marriages. And guys think they can do it all the time while they're watching the football and give that response and get away with it. Well, sorry, guys. <clears throat> Doesn't happen. Selective listening. This is recognised by the person who only hears certain parts of the conversation. We've all been accused of selective hearing. Yeah, yeah, me too. You didn't hear everything that I had to say. Yeah, I'm sorry. Selective listening. Children have got it big time. It's almost a disease with some kids. Very selective in their hearing. Active listening is when the person pays attention to the words being said, but the real listening is empathic. <clears throat> this is listening with intent to really understand what is being said and to really understand the feelings being expressed. The feelings being expressed. So Covey said it really well. He said, often people say, I can't understand this person. He or she just won't listen to me. <clears throat> what he said to that is they've got it around the wrong way. The, the issue is you should seek first to understand then to be understood. And often I've had people come in to me and say, I can't understand, you know, particularly, I mean, 
Yeah, uh, 25 years ago I used to do a lot of family therapy and marital work. I gave up on the marital work, it was just too hard. It's beyond me. But I, you know, people would come in and, and husbands or wives, partners would say, I can't understand him. He just doesn't listen to me. Well, I can't understand her, she just won't listen to me. And I'd say, well, have you actually listened to them first? What? What are you talking about, mate? Well, did you, have you taken time out to understand their story and what they really have to say? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, understand. yeah. they need to listen to me. <sighs> Big lessons to learn in that relationship. Caring about the others is seeking first to understand because <clears throat> we have two ears and one mouth and we should use them in that proportion. But communication, you see, is really a formula. In the first instance, we have listening skills that are very active, and we have question techniques that are very powerful. Put those two together, and you've got a good start to being a good listener. So first up, if we really want to learn how to listen well, <clears throat> and I know listening is the big issue for all of you, the big issue for all of you. I know that. Don't ask me how I know it, but I don't want to sound presumptuous or in any way arrogant, but I know it is. I've had enough conversations with people in this room and outside this room and enough conversations ABN to know listening is the key. It's a biggie. Not just for this company, by the way, but the community. It's a biggie. So, if it's a biggie, how do we do it? Well. There are six core skills. <clears throat> the first one is you give your undivided attention, you look and you don't interrupt. Remember, the eyes... Thank you, well done. The eyes have it. You look. <clears throat> and then you have to suspend your judgement. Now that, folks, is pretty tricky. Each of these skills, by the way, are explained in that Listen Up Now book. But Suspending your judgment is tricky. So how do we do that? Because if someone comes in to us, and let's say they've been in once or twice before into our office, let's say we might have something run through our head like, oh no, not them again. Oh, you've got to be joking. Oh, here we go. Not that any of you in this room would ever think that, because we are nice people. But some other people might have thought that about some people that come into their office now and again or run into them in the corridor. <clears throat> immediately that has happened, you have not suspended judgment. And as Carol said, you've immediately got a filter. You've got a filter that has screened out a lot of what they're about to say because you haven't suspended your judgment. You've made a call on them. Maybe then it's someone you've, you've um, not interacted much with before and they come into the office and they say, um, oh uh, Craig, if, uh, have you got a moment? I've got uh, something I really, really need to talk to you about. At this point, Craig's probably thinking, oh, strike, What's, what bomb's about to drop here? And so our filters go on. We can't help that. But the smart listener really puts that filter on the back burner. We all have it, but we try not to let it be front of mind. Does that make sense? And you park it. You go, yep, I can see the filter there. I'm going to move it to the back parking lot rather than have it front of house. Because we've all got those judgments. As soon as I get up here to talk, you're assessing me. As I talk and continue to talk, you're evaluating me. You can't help yourself. You know, some of you think, oh, I don't like this striped shirt or whatever, I don't like purple, or I don't know what it is, but you know, you're all doing an assessment of some sort. You can't help yourself. But, but if that gets in the road of our communication, then you, you have got a problem. You have to park it. And you have to say, well, regardless of the color of his shirt, I'll still talk to him. You know what I mean? So it's been the ability to park that is a, is a character strength and really important to do. Once we've parked it, if we're okay at that, 
we might then be able to paraphrase and feedback what we've heard. But that is the content. That is the matter. That is the data. That is the information. We feed it back. So what you're saying is, what I heard you say was, let me see if I've got this right. If I completely understand what you just said, it's putting it back there. What's the advantage of putting it back there? So I can hear some whisperings. Make sure you got the message right. Thank you, Sam. Make sure you've got the message right. How do you know you've got it right? They'll tell you. They will tell you. Because by putting it back there, I'm actually checking. Because otherwise, we could go like this in our conversation. And we have drama because we weren't checking as we went along that we were still on the same page. One of the exercises I did give when um, <clears throat> I was doing marital work is I made couples actually paraphrase something to the partner's satisfaction before they were then allowed to put their bit in. Did that slow up, slow up the communication? You bet it did. <clears throat> Did that make for effective com conversation? You bet it did. Very much so. So it's a key. It seems simple enough, but it's rare that people would do it. Rare that people would do that in a conversation. Most of the time we got up, yeah, yeah and we're straight on. We don't say, ah, so what you said was, <clears throat> and some people, particularly in construction, often say, jinx, mate, that's a bloody waste of time. Of course I bloody well heard it. What do you, you know, I don't need to regurgitate that over again. They think I'm a dunce. Or a DH or something. Eh. It's like, okay. So you're prepared to take a chance to go like that. And when it all comes unstuck, you're prepared to put in big hours and big money and everything else to fix it up. Whereas if you took another 30 seconds or 20 seconds or 10 seconds to track each other nicely, Return on investment I would have thought was good there. Another 30 seconds of paraphrasing and getting the story straight stops a three hour chaos situation or two hour plus money to boot. So once you've done that, if you're okay at that, you also might reflect back the feelings. <clears throat> and there are only basically five feelings you need to worry about. And the coaches in the room know those five feelings and they know them back to front and upside down. And there are only five negative ones. I mean, there are lots of positive ones, happiness and joy and peace and love, and they're all fabulous. Feel good feelings, and they're great to have in your life. But there are five negative feelings. What are those five? Coaches? Yep. Yep, let me just grab, there it is. So. Um, sorry, I heard depression, Steve, and anxiety. anxiety. Okay, let me put anxiety up first. Anxiety. And then <clears throat> Steve had depression. So they're the big three. They're the big three that you'll find mostly in the workplace and at home. Only we don't go around and say, I'm highly anxious. What words do we use? Stressed. Great. Stressed. Worried. Worried. Frustrated. Frustrated. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Uptight. You got it, right? If we're feeling depressed or... Oh, I nearly said it. Uh, what other words do we say? Feeling down. down. Low. Low. Flat. Flat. You got the... And if we're... Feeling angry, what words do we use? Frustrated. Pissed off. Frustration. Frustrated. Thank you, Josh. Annoyed. Irritated. Okay, they're the big three. Beyond the big three, there are two others. Now, the coaches can keep quiet on this one. Let's see if we can pick it. Because these are the two that are a bit difficult. One starts with G. What do you reckon it'll be? Thank you. You are? Jeremy. G. 
Jeremy, another Jeremy. Okay, guilt. Feeling ashamed. Folks, if you're knocking off the firm stationery, you ought to feel guilty. But often we feel guilty for reasons that are unnecessary. And the last one starts with R. Yeah, who said that? Noni, spot on it. Um, normally people don't get that one. So resentment. That is a big one. That's the one, by the way, that starts wars. That's where you'll have a, a massive divorce and it'll be bitter in the courts because there's too much of that resentment around the place. Bitterness. What's the difference between anger and resentment, folks? This is often short term. It flares. And by the way, the flip side of depression is often anger. So if you're an angry person, you're probably depressed. But moving right along. <laughs> resentment here is long-term anger. Long-term anger. You hold it and the bitterness will eventually kill you. It's an emotional cancer. If you've got bitterness in your life, for heaven's sakes, do yourself a favour and get rid of it. Dump it. Go and forgive someone. Or forgive yourself. Don't hang on to it. It's not worth it. It is not worth it. So it's long term. So once you acknowledge the feelings, and it probably is going to be one of those big five because it's generally negative, then you summarise. And you summarise at the end of the conversation or part way through the conversation. And you say, what I'm hearing you say, oh, let's bring it together. Or to recap. What's the advantage of bringing it together partway through the conversation or at the end of the conversation? What's the advantage? Make sure you're still on the same page. Bring it back into a nutshell. Condense it. Yep, absolutely. And then ask key questions. You see, there are many people who think just asking questions is listening. It ain't, folks. I'm sorry. It's not. Just asking questions is a police interview. It's really about paraphrasing, reflecting the feeling, summarising. That's all about giving feedback. Giving feedback in a communication sense. Someone once said, what I see, what I hear I forget, what I see I remember, what I do I understand. So right now, we have a test. It says this, on the next screen are four examples of listening. Numbered A to D to a person's initial comment. You are to do the following. If you think the response is good, in other words, the paraphrase of the content and a reflection of the feeling, then rate it with a positive sign. If you think it's inadequate or a poor response, rate it with a negative sign. Note that there, there may, in fact, not be any positive responses. Point two, if for any reason you do rate it with a negative sign, try to say why you think it's poor or inadequate. In other words, it's judgmental, it's premature advice, it's reassuring, it's going off on tangent, it's intellectualizing, etc. Make your reasons as specific as possible. Okay, so we have an employee who's going to give a comment, and then there are four responses that you're going to be given. You've got to pick whether the response is a positive one, in other words, it's one of the listening skills or it's a negative one because it's judgmental, it's intellectualizing, it's off target, whatever the case might be. Do you understand the task at hand? Anyone need clarity here? Everyone okay to go? All right. So the employee says you managers really are all the same, just like the rest of this outfit. You say one thing and you do another. This place isn't full of that integrity stuff that you're going about, it's just a joke. To that, you could, as the listener say, I'd like you to elaborate on that a little more. You could say, I feel that if we all keep our heads in this, things can work out. You strike me as a sincere kind of person, let me see if we can find some ways of settling things down. Or you say, Come back another time when you feel that you can speak a bit more civilly. Or you say, I feel that you're attacking me, even though I'm not part of the problem. Maybe we can talk out 
what's happening between you and me. You rate A, B, C and D with a positive or a negative. If one of those is an effective listening response, you give it a positive. If it's not, you give it a negative. A, B, C and D. Which one is a positive one? Which one is a negative one? No pluses here at all. What's the first one? There's no reference at all. No feeding back anything you've heard up here. What about number C? What's wrong with C? Dismissive. Yeah, tick off until you feel better and then come back again. Yeah, hardly a listening response. <clears throat> feel that you're attacking me even though I'm not part of the problem. It's intellectualising, it's way off the mark. If, if we did need appropriate response there, just feed back what you heard. Just stay with what they gave you. You feel resentful because, whatever the case might be. <clears throat> I know that's a bit stereotyped, but it's fairly effective. So if we followed that formula, how would you now formulate your response a reflection of feeling plus a paraphrase if you wanted to stay with that, that particular formula. You don't have to, but it's a very effective listening response. You're feeding back to someone the information. An admin person says, work is all right, I do make a good living, and my family really likes the money. And at work they like me. They like what I do, so my job is secure. But it's the same thing day after day. I'm maybe not the world's smartest person, but there's more to me than I use working on that computer. You formulate a listening response this time. You formulate your listening response. Okay, everyone be upstanding. I know it's a tight room, but there's someone else on another table you don't know. Go and meet them and say hello and swap your responses. Where you go. Who's prepared to show enough courage to read out their listening response? Coaches? You're not allowed to be involved. I'll go there. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Um, so you feel resentful because you believe you are not being utilised to your full potential. Great. Give her a big hand. <laughs> You're sort of caught because on the one hand you feel content about the money and job security, but on the other hand you believe that you're capable of more. Most paths lead to Rome. So, We've covered some listening skills, albeit very, very briefly. Remember, in an hour and a half, we're not going to change your behaviour. We're just going to maybe increase some awareness. Let's be realistic about this. The coaches in the room have gone through a year-long program with 50 hours of coaching and, and six days now of intensive work. So don't think you're suddenly going to get this in an hour and a half. You might, and if you did, let me know, please. I'd be really delighted, I'd bottle it, whatever it was. But we need to go on to question technique because that's a really important part. And the answer there is that we ask questions if necessary. Why don't we ask why questions? Because lots of people would ask why. Why did you do that? We do that with child rearing all the time. Four-year-old hits the two-year-old. Why did you do that? The four-year-old says, gee, Dad, I'm really glad you asked. <laughs> it's because of my Oedipal complex and my ego and the way I was actually born in the birth canal. And gee, Dad, it's fabulous. You should ask that. Kids don't have a clue why. And often we don't either. Don't ask a why. You'll get an excuse. We don't know why. And if we're supposed to know why, we'll make it up. So ask what or how and you'll get a very different answer. It's a very interesting technique with questions to ask a what and a how. And don't tell. Because do you and I like to be told? Yes or no? No. I don't like to be told. It's part of my ego and I have to keep on getting it in check. I don't like to be told. I like to be asked. I like to be asked. My wife's worked that out. She's really cool. You know, I might leave a dish around. I don't re really do that because I'm pretty neat, but let's say I did. She wouldn't say to me, Daryl, are you going to put this away? Or, darling, are you going to put this away? She would say, darling, have you finished with this plate? It's cool. Rather than, Daryl, you should put this away or you should clean up. It's, are you finished with this? 
Oh, sorry, darling. Yeah, yeah. It's very different in the communication, and my response is very different. <clears throat> so it's asking. And so you could say a bunch of things like, could you tell me more? What do you mean by that? Can you say more about that? Can you expand on that? I'm not sure I understand. Can you explain what you mean by, or in what way are you angry, depressed, anxious, feeling guilty, annoyed, whatever the case might be? You see, with this whole business of communication, we know that if you're really determined, it would take 14 to 21 days for neurological development to occur with behavioural activity. What on earth does that mean? That means that if you do it for 21 days, they're on the side of caution, you're more or less likely to get into a habit, more or less. So an hour and a half here is not going to cut it. Sorry. We're just not that clever. But if you practiced diligently these things, and you've got to work out how to do that, and it practice makes perfect, because repetition is the mother of skill. It's not rocket science, folks. You want to get good at cooking, what do you have to do? Cook. If you want to get good at golf, what do you have to do? Practice. If you want to get good at swimming, what do you have to do? Practice. Practice. If you want to get good at water polo, what do you have to do? Practice. What are the key points from today? What do you remember from today? Practice. Practice. <laughs> nice work. I like it. I like it. Practice makes perfect. Well, almost. What else do you remember? Listen. What about listening? Sorry, it's Simon. Simon, that's right. What about listening? What's it made up of? Yep, your body language, first up. What else is it made up of? Eye contact. Eye contact, first up. You stop and you look. And then what do you do? Suspend you su suspend your judgment. And then you look to do what? Paraphrase, Paraphrase and perhaps... Reflect the feeling. At the end of the conversation, you might summarize. summarize. In between there, you'll be tempted to ask some questions and often for clarification. Okay. Really important. Not the be-all and end-all of, of, of the whole of communication, but a really essential element of communication. So we're going to skip through these and skip through that. And I'd have to say to you, if you want to be something different, you have to do something different. So once upon a time, some of us in the room got a driver's license by walking into the police station and filling out 20 questions. And because you could do the theory on paper, they gave you the keys to a car. How ridiculous is that? Now you go into a police station or a department of transport, you do a whole bunch of assessments and get your piece of paper and they give you the keys to the car with a big L on it. And you get a log book and you hop around the Kmart car park or you go around the block or you go up and down the drive and you learn over time how to do this stuff. But it's a doing thing. You do something about it. So for some of you, it'll stay here in the room. For a few of you who are stars, you will actually take this and you'll make it happen for yourself and you'll practice and practice and practice. And the best place to practice is going to be with who? Family. Well done, Craig. Family. For some of you, it'll go like that and that's fine. Thank you for being part of the day. But for those of you who want to continue the journey, I wish you well. It will, in fact, be the most important journey of your life. You get this communication right, it'll set you apart as a man and woman like no other skill on the planet will. It is a defining skill, folks. If you want to be serious about your career, more importantly, if you want to be serious about yourself as a person, you'll take this communication skill and you'll run it hard. And you'll be an absolute champion at it. And if we ever have another coaching course, I'll be begging you to come on it because you'll be an absolute standout champion and people will recognize that and you'll know that yourself because you develop beneath the neckline in a way that you'd be proud of and others around you will be proud of it too. Good luck on the journey. Thanks very much.